Hi there, Tarantulas with Shanti here. Are you ready for another video? I hope so. This is a Hopi tale, a spider creation uh, myth, and it's one of many myths that involve spiders throughout the world. So I hope that you enjoy it. Um, I am going to make some changes here because I'm finding that making three videos a week is really rough for me. I have another project that I'm working on that's really important and I don't want the quality of my videos to suffer. I'd rather put out one for sure a week than put out three that I'm, I'm really trying to get out there. So one for sure that's going to be of better quality and then anything else that I put out throughout that week will be a bonus. So I hope that sounds good to you. And I hope you enjoy this video. Today I want to talk to you about the spider as a symbol in mythology and culture. And it is not usually known as a negative sign, as a lot of people have taken the spider today to be something creepy and something to fear. And so in our, our modern day and age, we have a lot of myths about spiders that are untrue. Um, the hobo spider was one example of this, and it became widely known that the hobo spider caused necrotic arachnidism, which means that its bite could cause the skin to rot and giant holes to appear in the skin or that a person could lose a leg. And we now know that this is not true and that there are other causes of this having to do with bacteria and not venom. But that's not what I want to focus on today. I want to talk to you about myths and stories within cultures. Now, the spider as a symbol, as a goddess of the Divine Mother in ancient Egypt, um, she was known as um, Nath. And the, she was a creation goddess, and she was a virgin. And this is long before uh, Christianity came about. And the spider is known as a symbol of creativity, patience, rebirth. And Nath was actually uh, connected to Arachne, who was a Greek um, mortal with spectacular skills in weaving. And she was turned into a spider by the jealous goddess Athena. Now, Arachne is a Greek word in origin. And it's actually where Arachnida, the spider's taxonomic class, came from. Now, throughout the world, the spider has been known as magical. And stories of spiders being creators and myths have been widespread. The Aztecs, uh, spiders in, in the Aztecs stories, <laughs> spiders were women's souls, and they would come down on silk threads and devour the men. Now we know the Aztecs had a very interesting culture, um, and I'm not sure how far um, we can look into that, but there may be more information available online about the Aztec view of spiders. In the Hindu religion, there was Maya, the spinner of webs. Odin, his horse, was a gigantic spider, and that was a symbol of his fate. So, in African creation, the deity was Anansi, or Kwaku Anansi, a trickster. And in the West Indies, also known as Aunt Na Nancy. Aunt Nancy. And these have a lot of or allegorical tales with morals um, that depict Anansi. I think Neil Gaiman also has a book about Anansi. Uh, Native American, uh, the, alleged, the origin of Ursa Major, the constellation. Seven men transformed into stars climbing to paradise via spider silk. And then in Peru, uh, the Kupiznik spider god of hunting, hunting nets, textiles, war, and power, 
nets were filled with decapitated human heads and Australian clan totems, and uh, they had uh, the oceanic area with the islander tribes that, uh, like the Kiribati, uh, the spider Nauru, created the universe. And then there was the earth spiders of Japan. Uh, let's, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly. Tsuchigumu. Tsuchigumu. Uh, creatures of Japan, and there was a prostitute spider, uh, Jorogumo, spider that transformed into seductive women and married passing samurai. So the spider has been all throughout the world in myth. And going back to Indra and in Buddhist India, all phenomenon are connected, and we know that that's a very prominent view in a lot of Eastern religions. So in a um, book called Vermeer's Hat by Timothy Brook, this is said, When Indra fashioned the world, he made it as a web, and at every knot in the web is tied a pearl. Everything that exists or has ever existed, every idea that can be thought about, Every datum that is true, every dharma, in the language of Indian philosophy, is a pearl in Indra's net. Not only is the pearl tied to every other pearl by virtue of the web on which they hang, but on the surface of every pearl is reflected every other jewel on the net. Everything that exists in Indra's net implies all else that exists. So what I'm going to do is read a myth to you. And this is a Hopi myth. This comes from the Hopi people of Northern Arizona. Hopi means people of peace. And these stories were recorded in the 1950s by Oswald White Bear Fredericks and his wife Naomi. And so they got these stories from some older Hopi in the village of Oribe. And so the Hopi have lived there in Oribe since 1150 AD. This story is called The Four Creations, and it is one of the myths that uh, we can associate with the spider. The Four Creations. The world at first was endless space in which existed only the creator, Taiowa. This world had no time, no shape, and no life, except in the mind of the Creator. Eventually, the infinite Creator created the finite in Sotugnang, whom he called his nephew and whom he created as his agent to establish nine universes. Sotugnang gathered together matter from the endless space to make the nine solid worlds. Then the Creator instructed him to gather together the waters from the endless space, and place them on these worlds to make land and sea. When Sotugnang had done that, the Creator instructed him to gather together air to make winds and breezes on these worlds. The fourth act of creation with which the Creator changed Sotugnang was the creation of life. Sotugnang went to the world that was to first host life, and there he created Spider Woman, and he gave her the power to create life. First Spider Woman took some earth and mixed it with saliva to make two beings. Over them she sang the creation song, and they came to life. She instructed one of them, Pokonghoya, to go across the earth and solidify it. She instructed the other, Palongawoya, to send out sound to resonate through the earth, so that the earth vibrated with the energy of the Creator. Pokongoya and Palongohoya were dispatched to the poles of the earth to keep it rotating. Then Spider Woman made all the plants, the flowers, the bushes, and the trees. Likewise, she made the birds and animals, again using earth and singing the creation song. When all this was done, she made human beings using yellow, red, white, and black earth mixed with her saliva. Singing the creation so song, she made four men, and then in her own form she made four women. 
At first, they had a soft spot in their foreheads, and although it solidified, it left a space through which they could hear the voices of Satugnung and their creator. Because these people could not speak, Spider Woman called on Satugnung, who gave them four languages. His only instructions were for them to respect their creator and to live in harmony with him. These people spread across the earth and multiplied. Despite their four languages, in those days they could understand each other's thoughts anyway, and for many years they and the animals lived together as one. Eventually, however, they began to divide, both the people from the animals and the people from each other, as they focused on their differences rather than their similarities. As division and suspicion became more widespread, only a few people from each of the four groups still remembered their creator. So Tugnung appeared before these few and told them that he and the creator would have to destroy this world, and that these few who remembered the creator must travel across the land, following a cloud and a star, to find refuge. These people began their treks from the places where they lived, and when they finally converged, Sotugnung appeared again. He opened a huge ant mound and told these people to go down in it to live with the ants while he destroyed the world with fire, and he told them to learn from the ants while they were there. The people went down and lived with the ants, who had storerooms of food that they had gathered in the summer, as well as chambers in which the people could live in. This went on for quite a while because after Satugnung cleansed the world with fire, it took a long time for the world to cool off. As the ants' food ran low, the people refused the food, but the ants kept feeding them and only tightened their own belts, which is why ants have such tiny waists today. Finally, Satugnung was done making the second world, which was not quite as beautiful as the first. Again, he admonished the people to remember their creator as they and the ants that had hosted them spread across the earth. The people multiplied rapidly and soon covered the entire earth. They did not live with the animals, however, because the animals in the second world were wild and unfriendly. Instead, the people lived in villages and built roads between these so that trade sprang up. They stored goods and traded those for goods from elsewhere and soon they were trading for things they did not need. As their desire to have more and more grew, they began to forget their creator, and soon wars over resources and trade were breaking out between villages. Finally, Sotugnung appeared before the few people who still remembered the creator. And again, he sent them to live with the ants while he destroyed this corrupt world. This time he ordered Pokonghoya, and Palangahoya to abandon their posts at the poles, and soon the world spun out of control and rolled over. Mountains slid and fell, and lakes and rivers splashed across the land as the earth tumbled, and finally the earth froze over into nothing but ice. This went on for years, and again the people lived with the ants. Finally, Sotugnung sent Pakonghoya and Palangahoya back to the poles to resume the normal rotation of the earth, and soon the ice melted and life returned. So Tugnung called the people up from their refuge, and he introduced them to the third world that he had made. Again, he admonished the people to remember their creator as they spread across the land, and they did so. They multiplied quickly, even more quickly than before, and soon they were living in large cities and developing into separate nations. With so many people, and so many nations, soon there was war, and some of the nations made huge shields on which they could fly, and from these flying shields they attacked other cities. When Sotugnung saw all this war and destruction, he resolved to destroy this world quickly before it corrupted the few people who still remembered the Creator. He called on Spider Woman to gather those few, and along the shore she placed each person with a little food in the hollow stem of a reed. When she had done this, Sotugnung let loose a flood that destroyed the warring cities and the world on which they lived. Once the rocking of the waves ceased, Spider Woman unsealed the reeds 
so the people could see. They floated on the water for many days, looking for land, until finally they drifted to an island. On the island they built little reed boats and set sail again to the east. After drifting many days, they came to a large island and after many more days to an even larger island. They hoped that this would be the fourth world that Sotugnung had made for them, but Spider Woman assured them that they still had a long and hard journey ahead. They walked across this island and built rafts on the far side and set sail to the east again. They came to a fourth and still larger island, but again they had to cross it on foot and then build more rafts to continue east. From this island, Spider Woman sent them on alone, and after many days they encountered a vast land. Its shores were so high that they could not find a place to land, and only by opening the doors of their heads did they know where to go to land. When they finally got ashore, Sotugnung was there waiting for them. As they watched to the west, he made the islands that they had used like stepping stones disappear into the sea. He welcomed them to the fourth world, but he warned them that it was not as beautiful as the previous ones, and that life here would be harder, with heat and cold, and tall mountains and deep valleys. He sent them on their way to migrate across the wild new land, in search of the homes for their respective clans. The clans were to migrate across the land to learn its ways, although some grew weak and stopped in the warm climates or rich lands along the way. The Hopi trekked far and wide and went through the cold and icy country to the north before finally settling in the arid lands between the Colorado River and the Rio Grande River. They chose that place so that the hardship of their life would always remind them of their dependence on and link to their creator. Now this story comes from a website called railsback.org. That's Rails, R-A-I-L-S, back, B-A-C-K, dot O-R-G. And this is a creation story from around the world. So I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this story. There are many creation stories to learn from and to read, and the, the similarities between them throughout the world is amazing. Uh, and also, it's the time of Christmas time. It's Christmas time or solstice, and right now there are, there are some myths um, about Christmas spiders. And you can go to my friend uh, Alex's YouTube channel. He is Tarantula Haven. And you can learn about the Christmas spiders there. He and his wife uh, make Christmas spiders that can be hung on your tree. And I will provide a link so that you can go and check those out. <laughs>